וואי, זה סרטון! יש! בן של זונה! איזה סרטון! הנה, תרוץ ולפנות אותו. בטח שצילמתי את זה. תחויה בן זונות. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict actually is one of the most straightforward things to explain. Um, if, if you gave me 15 minutes, I could explain the whole, con the whole conflict to you in a very, very straightforward way. What if I give you 30 seconds? Um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about the dispossession of land in a colonial situation. Uh, it's about Palestinians being dispossessed of their land by a colonial power. I first came to Palestine as a young child in 1967, just before the Six-Day War. After that war, the Israeli army controlled the daily lives of millions of Palestinians. It still does. In a career as a writer and broadcaster, I've been back to the Middle East many times. But now, a hundred years after Britain's Balfour Declaration set in motion the creation of Israel, I've come back. I want to try to understand the lives today of the people we British promised to protect because we broke our promise. What I don't really know, and maybe you don't either, is what life is like for nearly four and a half million people who live their daily lives under military occupation. It's one of the most iconic images of the Holy Land, almost to the point of being a visual cliché. That lump of rock, sacred to three religions, capped by a golden dome and framed, in this case, by barbed wire. And to be frank, there's no shortage of barbed wire in this land. Barbed wire, barriers, walls, all of them separating the communities of Palestine. 
This film will aim to examine those barriers and the consequences of a sequence of events set in motion a century ago by Britain's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour. The story of the Middle East is the complex tale of land shared over the centuries by different peoples and religions, of land lost or stolen, of people aggrieved and angry. But if we want to understand the genesis of the current instability, we must look back a century to when Britain used Palestine to further its own imperial interests. In the early days of the 20th century, Jerusalem was a cosmopolitan city where the various religions coexisted. It was ruled by the Turkish Ottoman Empire. During World War I, the Ottomans sided with Germany and Britain worked with Arab leaders to defeat them. Britain offered its Arab allies statehood after the war. But the Middle East's colonial superpowers, Britain and France, were secretly planning the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which would carve up the Middle East between them. Britain took control of the southern oil-rich lands. Then, in November 1917, the British Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour issued his celebrated declaration. It was the foundation stone of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. But Balfour also promised to protect the rights of the existing Arab population. That promise is now seen throughout the Arab world as a straightforward betrayal. So here we find ourselves under our friend Sir Arthur Balfour. Clearly, you don't name streets after somebody you dislike. I wonder how many Balfour streets I would find in the Palestinian territories. And sure enough, the Balfour Declaration for me is an old style imperialist way of controlling the world, controlling people's lives and fates, where Britain, who didn't have any legal reality or connection to Palestine, donated a piece of land, the whole country, that they have no legal connection to, to another group of people denying the original owners of the land and the country in a very hypocritic, I don't know what to use the word, you know, that's the biggest lie ever. The Balfour Declaration is not simply a notion of uh, mercy towards the Jews. Okay, it's much more than that. It uh, uh, reflects a strategy of how to deal with the Middle East, which is as simple as divide to conquer. Britain's naive about how Arabs remember history. I mean, as you will have found, you come here, you talk to anyone in the Arab region, they like Britain, Balfour, they know all about it. But yes. People are, are cynical and rightly cynical. He has created so many miseries and so many deaths and has even affected uh, the entire Middle East negatively, okay, and has even stirred a lot of wars and enmity and hatred among so many people, okay. Still until today, the British government doesn't want to uh, apologize for the uh, Balfour Declaration. Everyone knows the barbaric results of anti-Semitism in our own time. By the late 19th century, violent and often murderous anti-Semitic persecution had given rise to the Zionist movement, focused on a Jewish homeland. And many Christians believed that fulfilled a biblical prophecy. Among them was British Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour. His 1917 declaration was made in a letter to Lord Rothschild, a figurehead of Britain's Jewish community. It wasn't legally binding, but in 1922, the League of Nations gave Britain the mandate to administer Palestine and effectively enforced the Balfour Declaration. Britain had mixed reasons for supporting the dream of European Zionists to create a Jewish homeland, which wasn't always necessarily going to be in the Middle East. Britain ultimately supported that Jewish dream, but they broke their promise to protect the rights of the Arab majority.
the Zionist movement started with different ideas, not in Palestine. They suggested Uganda, they suggested Argentina, and then they decided to have uh, to colonize Palestine because it will be easier, it will be uh, much successful to convince the Jewish from different places in the world to come and to live in Palestine. So colonizing uh, uh, places in the third world was part of the way of thinking of the British and the Zionist uh, 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 leadership at that time. Balfour didn't want Jews coming into Britain because he wanted Britain to be for the British. Therefore, he also supported Jewish nationalism that wanted Jews to have their own state um, in the land of Israel. So there is no contradiction there. It worked for Balfour to come up with a way to help Jews leave Britain and return to their nation. This wasn't just a you know, small number of Zionists in some heroic effort, but it was in fact the whole imperial you know, machinery that was behind it. Um, and that's why, the, that's why the Zionist movement has been successful. Uh, it's because it's had power behind it. It's had major power, major state power, and major imperial power behind it. Israelis always tell you, we live in a very dangerous area, right? We live in the Middle East, there are lots of Arabs there. Let me remind you two things. First of all, I tell Israelis sometimes, why don't we take, just imagine, as a, take the Zionist project, put it in Scandinavia, put it in somewhere where everybody is... Uh, and how long would it take you before people would start shooting at you? So of course you have a problem. After World War II, thousands of Jews fled to Palestine. The British tried to stem the numbers and Zionists used terror tactics against them. Unable to resolve or even manage Arab-Israeli demands, Britain dropped Palestine into the lap of the United Nations. In 1948, Israel declared itself a nation. War with its neighbors quickly followed and Israel emerged victorious, holding vastly more land than the UN had envisaged. 1948 saw hundreds of thousands of Palestinians ejected from their land, never to return. Many refugees were housed in United Nations tents at first, later in breeze block rooms, and now live in the makeshift townships that followed. What we have here, the uh, two doors, this is one of the original uh, United Nations blocks that were built to replace the uh, hundred or so tents that were the origins of the refugee camp. And you can see um, all of these bullet holes are from the Israeli army. We are an Azraq family. We have been here since 1948. Our original village, its name is Al Kabo village. It's west of Jerusalem. And when the war happened between the Arabs and the Israeli army, they invaded the, the village, the, all of the villages, 400 villages in all Palestine. And they started to destroy all the houses and dismiss all the peoples outside uh, the village. They lost everything. And this is United Nations. Okay, they arrange uh, one room for us here. This is not occupation. This is uh, now they remove, eliminate us from this land. They want this land uh, completely, 100% for Israel. They think, uh, strictly they think that this land for them, that it is a gift from Allah, from God for them as a promised land. The Jews who now reached Palestine and those who'd arrived since World War I were said to be returning home to a place they believed God had promised them. Their new country was designed as a state with a uniquely Jewish identity. As to the people who had been inhabiting Palestine, in many cases part of the region's cultural mix for millennia, well they were a serious inconvenience. I'm on my way to the University of Tel Aviv to learn how a Palestinian village lies under the university's gleaming modern campus. Many Palestinians had their land and property stolen from them in 1948. The land has subsequently often been redeveloped. 
Umar al-Gubari works to educate Israelis about the realities behind their contemporary landscape. A Majdalen Baidas lost her family land here. The Israeli uh, education system, uh, the Israeli media, they will not say the truth about the Palestinian history and the Palestinian, Palestinian identity of the place. So you're saying that a lot of land was stolen from the Palestinian people and that that truth is in fact hidden from the Israeli population. It's hidden in a smart way and in a very tough way by education, by changing the landscape and the view and the identity of the place, you will come here and enjoy the Tel Aviv University and you will not, never know that the Palestinian village was exist here for hundreds of years. 2,000 people have been expelled in 1948 from this place. Majdolen Baidas showed me how her family's house has been built over by the university. The plaque naming the architects gives no clue that this was a redeveloped Palestinian building. So you're saying the Palestinians had no houses, but the Israeli families were able to say, I want that Palestinian yes. house, yes. I like that Palestinian house, and they moved in. My teacher, she's a, a Jew, she said, she said that to me. They asked us to choose the houses, and they find uh, gold and they find money and they find many things. And how does this make you feel today? Oh. Today and tomorrow. Also. <laughs> angry. Are you more sad or are you more angry? Both. Sad and angry. Why it's happened to us? Well. And how do you feel about the British? I, I, I'm sure that you help them to do it. Help them. Not only with the all the time. Where you here, you do it. And this is Baidas, uh, her father. This is your father? Yeah. And, and, and this, this, this was your house? This. Yes. So this is where your father lived? Father is born here. Uh -huh. Such an interesting <laughs> sequence of photographs here because we have a picture that shows um, Arabs and Jews, um, westernized, working together in industry, uh, producing oranges for the citrus industry uh, under the British time. And then look what you have here. You have the Palestinian houses abandoned. Some of them are still being lived in and belong to the university. Others have been demolished, no compensation, tiny part of the graveyard still exists. People aren't even allowed to tend the graves. And because we're rather close to the building of the Israeli Secret Service, we can't go and film there. My family and my parents, we have uh, uh, properties here in Haifa and other parts of Galilee, we lost everything. So my father began from zero. And I know where is our, our, our properties here in this city. They used these properties for the immigrants who came from North Africa in the 50s. We lost. It's not only my family. About one million Palestinians 531 villages Israel destroyed in 1948 and it's still the same way of destroying villages. Just in this morning they destroyed a Bedouin village in Negev. Israel's occupation restricts construction by Palestinians whilst allocating Israeli settlements extensive areas for expansion the policy forces Palestinians to build unlicensed homes, which the state incessantly demolishes. Solar panels and even schools built with international aid money aren't immune. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. In December 2017, 
President Trump made a statement that delighted the Israeli government but drew widespread international condemnation. It led to demonstrations and Palestinian deaths. I've judged this course of action to be in the best interests of the United States of America and the pursuit of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Trump's recognition of Jerusalem was so controversial because under international law, Israel is illegally occupying the city. Indeed, only a year earlier, the Obama administration had clearly been losing patience with Israel. Since 2011, multiple efforts to pursue peace through negotiations have failed. And since 2011, President Obama and Secretary Kerry have repeatedly warned, publicly and privately, that the absence of progress toward peace and continued settlement expansion was going to put the two-state solution at risk and threaten... On Israel's December the 23rd, 2016, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution condemning Israel's illegal settlements in Palestinian land. The resolution passed despite immense pressure from President-elect Donald Trump, but the Obama administration let it through, breaking America's long-standing policy of protecting Israel at the UN. It showed America's immense accumulated frustration over Israel's Palestinian policies. The resolution calls Israel's settlement activity a flagrant violation of international law. So what are the settlements? Basically, they're new communities inhabited by Jewish Israelis built on land occupied by Israel during the 1967 war. This was Israel in May 1967. In June, Israel anticipated war. Deciding to strike preemptively, it destroyed most of Egypt's air force and much of Syria's on the ground. The Six-Day War was a quick and overwhelming victory. Israel now held the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and the strategically important Golan Heights. It's the status of these territories and the people who live there that's been a major source of conflict ever since. I find it hard to even grasp that more than two generations of Palestinians have grown up knowing only life under military occupation. An apartheid state, injustice, the limitation of human rights for the pal an entire population essentially imprisoned and we haven't even started talking about Gaza where most uh, over half the population is under the age of 18. It's, it's essentially a, a child concentration camp. Gaza is ringed by the Israeli military. Its population of two million hemmed in and under severe sanctions with much deprivation. Its Hamas government widely viewed internationally as a militant organization, was nevertheless democratically elected. Rocket attacks from Gaza on surrounding Israeli settlements have killed approximately 30 Israelis since 2004. Israel's military responses have led to around 3,000 deaths in Gaza, half of them civilians. In March 2018, a campaign of protest began in the Gaza Strip. The Great March of Return demanded Palestinians' right of return to what's now Israel. Among the tens of thousands of peaceful protesters, groups of young men behaved provocatively near the barbed wire border. Israeli snipers responded with explosive bullets, killing numerous unarmed people in broad daylight. Over 120 Palestinians died and 14,000 were injured. The press and paramedics were deemed legitimate targets. Nurse Razan al-Najjar was shot and killed as she approached wounded people. Israel's use of deadly force drew outraged headlines around the world and was later condemned by a United Nations General Assembly resolution. The other Palestinian territory, the Israeli-occupied West Bank, has seen illegal Jewish settlements spread fast. They're served by segregated highways, ringed by barriers, 
and protected by heavily armed troops. The settlers are often heavily armed too. <laughs> Under the Geneva Convention, which Israel is a signatory to, um, you are not allowed to move your own populations into land which you have acquired uh, by force during wartime. There's no doubt under international law that the, the occupation itself and the settlements and the movement of Israeli citizens into that land um, is illegal. But not only has Israeli government subsidized construction of settlements surged ahead, Separate legal regimes offer Jewish settlers rights Palestinians don't enjoy, and Palestinian land is constantly being confiscated or seized. Israel is governed by the right-wing Likud party that relies on coalition with far-right religious parties to stay in power. As a result, the country's policies are relentlessly anti-Palestinian. Some Israelis oppose their country's illegal occupation of Palestine. They're a minority, but a passionate minority. The anti-war group Women in Black was founded in 1988. Members demonstrate at a prominent central Jerusalem roundabout every week. Their opponents aren't afraid of making their own views plain, not least this woman who drapes herself in Israeli flags and sings patriotic songs. When we tried to interview her, the police intervened. We steal land of the Palestinians in order to build settlements and all other bad things. It has to be stopped. In 2000, Israel began construction of its Great Wall, which is currently 440 kilometers long, with a total of 708 kilometers planned. Initially presented as a temporary measure against suicide bombings, it cuts in many places deep inside Palestine, and critics say it was really planned as a land grab and a permanent frontier. The International Court of Justice found the wall a violation of international law and the UN General Assembly has adopted a resolution that condemns it. And this astonishing man-made division is advancing at breakneck speed, slicing through Palestinian land with indifference and impunity. So I'm driving now through the Kremasan Monastery vineyard and they're building the wall straight through the middle of the vineyard despite the protestations of the Catholic Church and you can see the construction going on right across the road here. This wall is believed to be uh, surrounding the West Bank. It, uh, Israel is promoted as a security uh, wall, but it's not much of a security. Uh, many kids can actually jump over the wall, okay, and many kids actually jump over the wall to go and find work. And this is actually an attempt to uh, take the or create a border, uh, a status quo border. The wall was a land grab, uh, annexation of land and aquifers. You know, if you look at a map and you look at where the aquifers are, you'll see the wall route accidentally takes a large portion of the aquifers. You know, and who controls the water? The water is life, so they control us. And then there are also these uh, military sniper towers throughout it. I think just to make sure that we know that they're still there. You know, intimidation, making sure we know our place. The balcony behind me is where, about 10 years ago, a child was shot. Uh, he was playing with a toy machine gun, and you see, he was taken out.
It is really odd when you're just walking around that the soldiers step out fully armed and stare at you in an intimidating way. What point are they trying to make? Can I have some of these, please? One kilo. Um, can I have three or four? What, what must it have been like when you were living here and suddenly you begin to see these vast walls sprouting all around your home? <laughs> when you suddenly see your village turning into a kind of prison camp. But what impact has the war had on those growing up in its shadow? I mean, we grew up with the walls and from day one, or for example, when we start actually realizing what that means, we, we feel limited and somehow discouraged through life. You know, we feel like dreams do not exist anymore. And um, we start hating what's behind that wall. Sometimes we close the door for the children to come because it's a bit risky and it's not comfortable for them to come and smell the tear gas. So uh, children's been affected from the trauma, uh, bedwetting, uh, uh, also the fear that they are uh, living. Like in the morning, I was telling some of the kids, why you didn't go to the fun fair yesterday? He said to me, he's maybe 10 years. He said, Lucy, do you know that we are living in a fun fair? And the fun fair, it's a bit scary. And riding one of the, uh, what do you call it? The rides. The rides, it's a scary. So I, 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 I cannot do it. I cannot make it. I live in fear all the time, so you want me to add the fear on my life? No, sorry, I don't want to. You know, my grandma lives in Jerusalem, and I started, you know, worrying about her and how I'm going to visit her, how I'm going to go see my cousins and all that. I had to get searched and ask for my papers and my ID and seeing people with guns all the time, not being able to go different places didn't exactly understand that, but I felt that this is not freedom. I started feeling sadness in my heart and started praying to God, you know, God, why? Why is this happening, you know? So I felt, you know, frustrated and angry. I have hope and uh, I can't uh, live with uh, this shame uh, Situation. Situation. And. Uh, Can it change? Can the situation change? Change? I don't know, but uh, we are uh, the change, we are the future. I know, you know there is uh, a way to change. Uh, we decided to paint something on the wall, you know, kind of art expressing oneself. And the, and the youth decided to paint the phrase, now that you know, you are responsible. And so we painted white over some of the other stuff that was there. And, uh, and let it dry for a day. And in the night, it seems the soldiers came down and in Hebrew with spray paint, they wrote, give up on your dreams, they will not come true. And, uh, and so in response, we painted over that again and then we wrote in the white, we will win. <laughs> they built the wall as a prison for the Palestinians. Okay, but the wall is also prison for the Israelis. And as they the Germans destroyed the, the wall in Berlin, this wall will collapse in a few years. What's going to make it fall down? It will fall down. It will, it will end. This is what many Palestinians face daily. It's 5 a.m. and in Bethlehem, these men and women are racing to get through the Israeli army checkpoint 
to be allowed into Jerusalem to do a day's work. an unpleasant, humiliating and utterly non-negotiable aspect of Palestinian life. People behind the wall are confined to zones with strictly controlled movement between the zones determined by different identity cards. How and if they're allowed into Israel to work or meet their families also depends on the color of their cards. When my daughters uh, were born, because their father had a different color of an ID, and I gave birth in Jerusalem, and I was working in Jerusalem, I was paying all my taxes in Jerusalem, yet the Israeli hospital refused to give me birth certificates for my daughters. Officially, they, were, they didn't exist for the Israeli occupation. It took me years to fight in court until one day the Israeli army raided my house early morning and checked even the pampers of my daughters, checked the sugar, checked the tea to make sure that I am not lying to them. Not far from Jerusalem's old city is the Educational Bookshop, a famous intellectual landmark Down in the basement, the location of many a literary soiree, manager and writer Mahmoud Muna told me how he sees the occupation cunningly dividing Palestinians even among themselves. We are fighting within our own society on how to move from one hierarchy to a better. Some Palestinians can move freely from one area to another. Some cannot. Some can move outside Palestine and come back. Some cannot even come back. People in Gaza can't really come outside Gaza. So, while I am in Jerusalem, I can travel inside the historic Palestine freely, except Gaza. This is seen as the top kind of level within the Israeli discriminatory racist discrimination system, while the Palestinians in the West Bank who can travel maybe internally, with some, of course, with some obstacles moving between the Palestinian cities, are better than the people in Gaza who can't come out of Gaza. And we all are better than the refugees who can't even come to Palestine, because people who have disadvantages or some privilege, they think they are better than the others because they've been occupied for longer or they've been occupied differently and so on. So there's really a level of hierarchy that have been established by the State of Israel and we Palestinians are trying to fight between, between ourselves on how to be better occupied. It's who controls the media? It's not the Palestinians. And so the media tends to portray Palestinians. I think uh, they have become synonymous with uh, terrorists and things like that, you know. And, and so they don't see the weekly demonstrations, the nonviolent demonstrations that are attacked with tear gas, rubber bullets, live ammunition, and arrests. Uh, one of my friends uh, from, uh, from school, he was 15 years old. He went to one protest, his first protest, just, you know, it was on a big day, it was a nonviolent demonstration. He went. Tear gas started being shot and stones started being exchanged. And so he left. He went home. That, that evening, the soldiers came to his house, arrested him, imprisoned him. Six months. His family didn't know where he was. Fifteen years old. No trial. No nothing. I uh, spent uh, six months at a cell without uh, seeing uh, the sun or any light. I was uh, tortured like different ways. Like by, uh, I have been tortured by by uh, dogs. Uh, they threatened me like uh, if I didn't talk, they will they will kill my family. Sometimes they bring like some T-shirt or something like put it uh, on my mouth and uh, dropping water. Like, it's called waterboarding. Yes. So you uh, feel like you're drowning. You can't. Yes. You can't breathe. Yes, I can't breathe. Yeah, if, if I didn't tell my story, 
like uh, people want to know the real face of the of the Ezra. They have to know like uh, Ezra like have uh, two faces, like the good uh, first one, the good face, and the second one, the bad face. Perhaps nowhere in Palestine is the division between Jews and Palestinians more extreme, violent, and surreal than in Hebron, because here the two live in closer and more bitter proximity than anywhere else. It's dead. So many of the businesses have been shut down and people either can't or don't want to come here to shop. It's just too difficult, too dangerous, too unpleasant. Hundreds of businesses have been closed. See, there's a campaign to try and reopen it. Well, fat chance of that. You can see concrete blocks have been put across the street, and beyond, you can see a newly planted settlement. I'm standing on what used to be a gold and jewellery market. It's now completely closed. It's right next to the settlement. Amazingly, there are metal grids built right over the street here by a foreign uh, aid agency to protect the Palestinians in the streets from objects, and I mean unpleasant objects, being thrown down from the settlers. And this is the way they treat us. They throw all kind of garbage and the trash, and sometimes it goes further, more than that by pouring at people liquid, such as dirty water, bleach, urine, rotten eggs, so many things. And all that happens in front of the soldiers' eyes. Military army watching tower. When things happen, we do complain, we shout, we scream, at least to stop them, give us a chance to live in peace, to live a decent life, they ignore us. That means leave the market for us, we want to take it. If it's not now, in the future, they're gonna take it. 
I think what I feel about Hebron more than anything else is the pain and the frustration. The Jews walking around, slowly forcing their way back into the city because they feel they have the historic right to do so. Muslims in a city that has its economy destroyed. Um, the two sides unable to communicate, but one side clearly in the ascendancy, backed by the government, the other side in retreat. Notorious in Hebron are the settler tours, where orthodox settlers and tourists, protected by the army, parade provocatively through the Palestinian quarter, making clear their own prior claims to possess the city. Usama is a tour guide who regularly leads non-Jewish tourists who want to observe the settler tours. Recently, one young Jewish tourist aggressively taunted him. So how did you feel when that settler treated you like that? Uh, to be frank, I was not happy. I was angry, you know, just someone who I don't know just looked to me and tell me uh, that this land is theirs and they want to control everything, they want to kill all the Arabs. This is something nonsense, you know, I don't like to hear. I was a little bit shocked, scared. We need to have statements for better understanding and reconciliation, not statement of hatred and denying the other and claiming that it's only their rights to be here and Arabs need to be killed or, or deported. Over lunch with Osama, I tried to push him on whether the violence was really all on the Israeli side. There is many narratives. There is hundreds of narratives on the Israeli side. There is hundreds of narratives on the Palestinian side. But there is only one fact. We are living under Israeli military occupation, which is an evil system that harass us and uh, violate all our rights. And it's, 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 it's more than occupation. It's apartheid system prevent us from our, you know, reach our land, uh, our resources. And uh, why are you personally committed to non-violence? Because I'm a human, and I don't want to lose any part of my humanity. I'm totally against violence, uh, 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 and we have a just case since our case is just. Why shall we give the excuse for the Israelis? And this is what they want. They're driving us toward the corner. Dr. Zoe Holman is a journalist and Middle East specialist. As we walk through Hebron's now impoverished Palestinian market, I asked how she felt when she heard phrases like apartheid and ethnic cleansing in the Palestinian context. Oh, they make me feel disturbed, but I, I don't think they're inaccurate. You know, I mean, you look at the world, you look at even Hebron, there's areas where, you know, Palestinians can't go, where Palestinians can't drive. I mean, you have communities being squeezed out stripped of resources, you know, stripped of their livelihoods. You know, what better definition of apartheid do you need in some ways? The author Ofra Yeshua Lithe, who's an Israeli and Jewish, has condemned what she sees as Israel's state racism. We don't have petty apartheid in, in old Israel. We don't have uh, special buses, we don't have special uh, uh, lavatories, we don't have these kind of regulations. But on the big issues, on land purchase, on where you can where you can live, where you can uh, how you can live with your family, whether you can leave the country and come back, whether you have citizenship or you're, you're an equal citizen, yeah, then you have apartheid in all these points. It's surely amazing that Israel, built by the survivors of Hitler's Holocaust, could be accused of the notorious human rights violation that scarred South Africa. But for over a decade. Critics outside and inside Israel, Jews as well as Arabs, have been accusing Israel's right-wing governments of practicing apartheid. Shocking as the accusation of apartheid is, it has serious formal backing. In early 2017, this United Nations report squarely accused Israel of imposing an apartheid regime of racial discrimination on the Palestinian people. 
The report was written by senior international jurists, but after a massive outcry accused it of bias, it was suppressed. This was how the woman who commissioned the report defended her decision to the BBC. This is a case where Israel sent its population to settle in the West Bank, to colonize the West Bank. So you ended up with, with uh, an occupied territory with two populations. I mean, we're saying we have a system of apartheid. At least, at minimum, we have a system of, of racial segregation and discrimination. We cannot live with such a system in the 20, uh, 21st century. Here, close to the main checkpoint into Bethlehem, just meters away from and overshadowed by the separation wall, is one man's response to the Palestinian experience. The British artist Banksy has created an extraordinary performance artwork, a hotel. It's called, wittily, the Walled Off Hotel. Oh, wow. <laughs> Whew. Banksy's presidential suite is a riotous orgy of kitsch, but it has a serious message. In one corner, there is Balfour's office. The open plan bath is fed by water from a tank riddled with bullet holes. The presidential suite normally would have implications of privilege. Uh, at the Banksy Hotel, it gives you the privilege of seeing the separation wall under construction. It feels like an alternative reality. And men at work, uh, high technology, electronics, guns, surveillance, cement, barbed wire, all of it. You know, oh, sorry, I'm lost for words. But if there's anger at the Banksy Hotel, it's mostly under control, channeled into cutting, intelligent irony. The decor bitingly satirizes the whole British colonial enterprise. When I spoke to the hotel's general manager, Wissam Salsa, he was at first keen to maintain the legend of Banksy's total anonymity. But I did meet a guy in the town who said, yeah, I saw Banksy, I, I saw him um, in, in the middle of the night uh, making one of his uh, uh, stencils. Yeah. So I can tell you exactly what he looks like. He's a tall guy, he was tanned, had grey hair. Uh, is that an accurate description? I have no idea, man. <laughs> um, these legends and stories. In a way, this, is, as this whole building is a work of art. It's a kind of installation, I think. You know, some, some art installations you move through, they have video or audio. But here you, you spend a night in the installation, don't you? Banksy is something very unusual to work with. Banksy interfered almost in every single detail in this building. This is why I lost my hair. See, I got crazy. <laughs> what is this hotel trying to do? Okay, our hotel was opened in 2017, this year, and this is 100 years for Belfort Declaration. And I think it is again to remind the world that look what happened because of this minister who just signed a, a piece of paper. So this is my room at the Banksy Hotel. It's actually a dormitory with uh, six bunk beds in it. And I'm not sure it's supposed to feel like a prison. It actually feels a bit more like a military barracks where Israeli conscripts or British conscripts in the 1940s might have stayed. And I'm not sure exactly how it makes me feel, but I think it's supposed to evoke a feeling of guilt. There's something very English about this hotel. It isn't owned by Banksy. Indeed, beyond his creative involvement, it's entirely a Palestinian operation. But its aesthetics represent a twin attack. It's certainly an assault on Israel's Palestinian occupation. Here is Jesus, a sniper's laser focused on his forehead. Here, an image of classical beauty wears a scarf over its mouth and is wreathed in tear gas. But the hotel is at least as much an attack on the Brits. 
with its parodies of British art, a blindfolded Victoria, with its kitsch crockery, the hotel is an attack on British taste. This is not the death camp commandant who goes home to listen to Beethoven and Bach. This suggests that the British culture that could indifferently carve up the Arab region was nothing lofty and superior. This suggests smugness, small-mindedness, mediocrity, the narrow, self-centered little Englandism of Brexit. The aesthetic of this place is pretty well summed up by the dish they serve your scrambled egg in, which is the kind of thing they might have put your appendix in in the 1950s after they removed it. <laughs> after my breakfast egg, I enjoyed the suffocating irony of coffee on a veranda from which I could almost reach out and touch the wall. Banksy has offered more than just a supremely ironic piece of installation art. The Waldorf Hotel has its own ensuite museum, which tries to explain both how it all happened and the consequences too. This is art as activism, art as lens, art as mirror. Can we face what we see in the reflection? It led me to want to ask Banksy's kitsch Balfour effigy an overwhelming question. Lord Balfour, a hundred years after your infamous declaration, how do you feel about what it achieved? But Balfour didn't have an answer for me. Palestinians continue to have their homes repossessed. Many lost good homes in 1948 when their houses were occupied by Jews. They had to move into empty homes Jews had vacated. But now they're being evicted from these homes too. And of course, they're not being allowed back into the better homes they originally lost. Here at Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem, Palestinians supported by liberal-minded Jews protest against their forced eviction. The Palestinians who were living here, they were refugees from 48. So now they are being forced to become refugees for the second time in their lifetime. After the Sheikh Jarrah demo, we were invited to supper by some of the Jewish Israelis we'd met. They were eager to share their despair at the far-right direction their country has lurched into in recent years. You've been to Machan Yehuda market? No. <laughs> it's a market... Uh... It's an old-fashioned market, mm -hmm. and then you can buy fruits, uh, meat, things. And we are the chosen one, the Jews, okay? And all the others are uh, beneath us. We are the, the people of the book, and all the others, not, not smart as us, of course. That's what uh, people and children are taught in school. As they are better than others. So if they are better than others, they are better, of course, from Palestinians. If I am demonstrating in the, or doing some illegal action in the West Bank, according to the Israeli law that applies to me as an Israeli citizen, I should be brought before a judge within, four, within 24 hours. If I'm a Palestinian, it may be between four to eight days. In four to eight days, in interrogation of the Israeli secret services, you will commit yourself to being a brother of bin Laden. So this is the difference. Israel became a laboratory of uh, using uh, weapons. So it's nice to have us. We're developing many kind of new machines, um, bombs, guns, and we have Gaza, we have the West Bank. We can try it on people. We can see the danger of very strong fascist uh, trends inside the Israeli society. You know what they usually tell you? Oh, you forget the Holocaust. Jews are persecuted everywhere, everywhere else. If we don't have a Jewish state, we will not survive. And that's it, you know, shut you up. Israeli kids go to Auschwitz uh, and, and wrap themselves in Israeli flags. It's, it's really a sorry sight, you know, it's sort of injected into their veins that they are 
always the victims, always the miserable ones, always the hated ones. While you, you tell them that they are the pe perpetrators now, they are the oppressors, and they're doing everything that, uh, you know, that the anti-Semites of the world did to the Jews, and they'll call you an anti-Semite or a self-hating Jew, if you happen to be a Jew. The last few years I've been traveling to Europe because of my work, and I'm really, you know, like, uh, having a hard time with criticizing Israel, you know, like, or saying anything, you know, like, about the Zionist movement or Jewish, you know, and it's getting very sensitive for European. Accusing you, you know, like, for being, you know, racist even sometime against the Jews and all these things, you know, like, by saying anything bad about Israel, I'm Semitic, you know, like, so... How come you're, they accusing me for being, you know, like anti-Semitic, you know, like I never understand it, you know, and start to be honest, recently it started to be annoying for me, you know, that you cannot criticize or you cannot even talk about the, the problems that you're facing every day. an obsession with hanging their flag everywhere. My personal opinion is it's to do two things. It's to make people feel bad, we're rubbing it in your face, the occupation and so on. The other thing is probably because of their own insecure national psyche, they need this assurance all the time that we are part of this country and we have, you know, this nationalism going on and so on. To us Palestinians, whenever we look at it, something bitter catches in our throat. It's reminding you every single day, it's never giving you a chance to forget. I think there is actually is a great deal of agreement between the Israeli society and the oppressive Israeli state. If you're going to do a peace process, then you have to start from where people are standing today. And I think we're not friends. We are not in good terms. We are actually enemies. And I think the level of hate have been increasing in the recent years. And that's not me advocating hate or it's not me trying to say that it is good that there is hate. It's just really being realistic. There is a very, very bad relationship between Palestinian and Israeli. I think the challenge for Israeli society today is whether it wants to be Jewish or whether it wants to be democratic, because it seems to me that you can't be both. And what you're seeing right now in Israel is a, is a debate about how much democracy are we willing to give up in order to maintain a Jewish state. There is a triangle of concepts. There is Judaism, there is democracy, and there is the land. And I hold to the view that Israel can have two of the three, but can't have all the land with democracy and with Judaism as the mainstay of the state. So Israel has a choice to make, and the choice is, I think, being obscured by current policy, which is to kick the can down the road and build settlements. If Israel makes the choice for democracy and for a Jewish state, a Jewish majority state, in my mind, that necessarily means that they allow the other people to express their right to self-determination in their own state. Long term, I think Palestinians have a lot to hope for, actually. Uh, I think the Israeli society, the way it's been progressing within itself, it's going uh, quite fast, actually, to self, uh, self-destruct. I think the Israeli society is very unhealthy. I think the Israeli society is very unstable. So long term, I'm optimistic. Uh, short term, I think there's not much to be optimistic about. really hard not to remember the several people I met on the Palestinian side of the wall who said, you know, we would love to be able to take our families whenever we want to the sea. I was just talking to a guy in the bar here. He didn't want to be interviewed on camera. He was with his wife and little baby. And I said, would you like to take them to see the West Bank? And he said, yeah, a little wistfully, but it's too dangerous. Of course, I was there doing my military service, he said. But we just have to try and put all that stuff out of our mind. Tel Aviv is pleasure-loving, a little bit hedonistic, oiled bodies, beach culture. 
But I can't help thinking that a few hundred miles to the east of here, there's a violent war going on, supposedly to destroy the last remnants of ISIS. And much closer, of course, there are the Palestinians behind the walls. And all of that is the legacy of the British. Today, the land Balfour helped create continues to insist it's in a permanent state of existential threat. In fact, it's at peace with most of its neighbors. It has a nuclear arsenal and a powerful friend. This country, with its tiny population of 8 million, makes 10% of all global armaments. And surely it can't be proud of its long history of selling weapons to dictatorships and rogue regimes. Israel is a westernized country, stridently self-confident. Yet, maintaining a security state costs money, and many Israelis are very far from prosperous. Consumer gloss prevails in Israel, alongside orthodox religion and militarism. But can they succeed in making everyone forget the reality of Palestine? Zionism in the state of Israel has always relied on superpower backing. First it was Britain through the Balfour Declaration, today it's the United States of America. If anything is going to change its international opinion, particularly from leading powers, whether it's Britain or whether it's America, whether, whether it's the EU, you know, we have to change our attitude towards Israel. It's the world powers that have got to make a decision that this can't go on any longer. The world is rough and without law and upholding it, we suffer. How much more are the Palestinians suffering now because the law is on their side but is not enacted? We are in a democracy. The people can persuade, cajole, press MPs and our government to act. And I hope they will. In truth, there are many Palestines all around the world. If democratic Israel is so manifestly an unequal state, I found myself meditating on the threats to freedom lurking everywhere, not least in the current resurgence of the far right in Britain and elsewhere. Je suis Charlie, they said in France, but je suis Palestine too. For all our sakes, surely Palestine must be transformed. This was a journey through Israel and Palestine in the shadow of a declaration by an Englishman. Let there be Israel, but let the Arab populations be safeguarded too. Well, the superpowers forgot all about that second bit. Little about my encounters in Israel and Palestine led me to expect some imminent change. But one thing did strike me about the Palestinians I met. They were frequently melancholy, but they were also forward-looking, determined to forge their own future out from under the yoke of the new colonizer, Israel. And there was something else they all said to me. Come and visit Palestine, learn about this land. Civilization means cultural heritage, identities, food, even the way you make coffee, the way you make tea, everything adds value to a certain identity. Tourism actually is a tool, it's a vehicle that will help protect the cultural heritage. And so tourism is a tool for protection of civilizations. We love the international to come and see, not to get stories from the news. We want them to come to meet people. We are the living stones. Come to visit, you know. Um, the students are very hospitable and friendly people, and they're very proud of their tradition and their country, and they have great history, and they take that very seriously. So yeah, I think it's really amazing when people come here and see from the, for this for themselves, you know. But when you come and have the time to sit with the peoples, to hear their stories, we are not 
in, like encouraging the international to come to be uh, empathize or sympathize with us. No. We want them to come to see. And also we encourage them to be pro-justice, not even pro-Palestinian or pro-Israelis. We want them to be pro-justice. So there's a lot to see in Palestine. Foods, churches, holy places, and the most important, to meet the people, to hear them, and definitely you will be more than happy. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you.